It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. I'm so excited to welcome Susan Orlean back to our show. Susan is a staff writer at The New Yorker. She's also appeared in Vogue and Esquire on This American Life. She's the author of eight books covering topics like New England, Saturday Night in America, and Orchid Fanatics. The last one, The Orchid Thief, ended up being the basis of the Academy Award-nominated film Adaptation. Susan is a disarming interviewer, a meticulous researcher, and a beautiful writer. These days, she lives here in Los Angeles, where we make our show. And being an author and a reader, she has visited the beautiful historic Central Library here dozens and dozens of times. Her latest book is about that library and its history, and particularly about the devastating fire that almost demolished the library in 1986. The book is also kind of a pay-on to libraries everywhere, what they mean to her, what they mean to us, and why every library is a vital institution. The book is called The Library Book. It's one of my favorites I've read this year. Susan Orlean, uh, welcome back to Bullseye. Always happy to see you. Oh, it's great to be with you. Susan, what is your relationship with libraries personally, other than your obvious financial relationship uh, with right. libraries? <laughs> <laughs> one would hope. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up going to the library. That was very much a part of my childhood. My parents were great library goers. They didn't really believe in buying books. They, I think they felt like, why would you buy a book? You can go to the library and borrow the book. And if it's not in, you put your name on a hold list and you get it when it's available. And they were born in the Depression, and I'm sure that's a lot of it, which is that buying books seemed like a bit of an indulgence that wasn't necessary. I grew up going to the library a couple times a week with my mom, and I found it absolutely magical. It was not like going to a bookstore or a toy store. It was partly because there was no money, there was no financial relationship. And when you're a kid, the idea that you can have anything you want is really intoxicating. And a library is on a real short list of places that welcome everyone, including kids who are a hassle. Right. <laughs> well, and I do think that in the last 20 years, we've, as a society, become more and more conscious, I kind of call it the Starbucks effect. We've become conscious of how there's home and there's your workplace and there's kind of a desire for another place, somewhere to go, somewhere to see other humans and just sort of share the space with them. It's, I think it's why people go to co-working spaces. I think it's why people go to public parks, even if they've got a backyard. There's something very special about being somewhere around other people and you're not there to interact with them. You're just sharing the space with them. And that's definitely some a quality of libraries. I mean, their their closest analog is probably a public park. You know, there's serve there are things to do in a park and there's, you know, God knows what that the city offers, but sometimes it's just kind of nice to be there and there are other people there. It's also a space that we share with a variety of people. It's not a mediated group of people. It's a chance that you're going to encounter a huge range of people, which for some, it's kind of discomforting. But for other people, you could make the argument that it's kind of an opportunity to really see your community. You have written for The New Yorker for 30 some years. And, <laughs> uh, and you were a New Yorker for a long time. How did your experience of living in Los Angeles compare to your expectations about Los Angeles? I had traveled here a lot over the years before I moved here and had been downtown once, as far as I knew. Um, my expectation of Los Angeles was that I would never spend time downtown. And at the time I moved here, which is now seven years ago, downtown was just on the brink of really changing. 
and revitalizing and repopulating. I never imagined that I would be doing a book about the library. I moved to Los Angeles because my husband was asked to help with the company that was starting up. And we thought, oh, that would be fun. We'll go for a year. We'll get some nice weather and go back to New York at the end of the year. In the course of being here, I was given a tour of the downtown library. And first of all, I thought, oh, my God, this building is amazing. It's a beautiful building and a very eccentric, interesting piece of architecture, 1920s era, but inflected with all of this sort of Egyptian and Moroccan kind of uh, aesthetic. It's, it's a really interesting building. So I was kind of struck immediately just about what a cool building it was and how I had never been downtown to see it. But walking through the library and thinking, boy, this is just an incredible repository of amazing stories. I was being told some of the stories of uh, various city librarians who had run the library over the years, many of whom were incredibly eccentric, fascinating figures. And I found myself just being drawn in more and more thinking, oh, my God, this is an amazing place. Somebody should write about this. Not thinking that somebody was me. <laughs> um, and right at that moment, the person giving me the tour had pulled one of the books off a shelf and took a deep whiff of the book. I thought, well, I guess I'm in a new city where people <laughs> do things like smell books. And I, I kind of dismissed it. Until he said, well, you can still smell the smoke in some of them. And I thought, wow, they used to let people smoke in the library? That seemed very bold. And I said, well, you know, was this back when they allowed smoking? And he said, no, they didn't ever allow smoking in the building. It was from the fire. I said, what fire? And he said, the big fire, the big fire in 1986. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, the big fire closed the library down for seven years. And, you know, he moved on and I was going like, what? What? Stop. Stop. What? No, no, don't. I don't want to see the next room. I want to hear about this fire. That was the moment where that frame of this is a great story really, truly clicked into place. And became a real story in my head, which was I wanted to write about the library. And in this case, the library had had this dramatic event that really shaped it in many ways. And it coalesced into a real story for me. And I knew immediately. I just thought, I'm doing a book about this. So your book has a few lines of inquiry in it. One of them is a sort of uh, behind the scenes at the library, you uh, skulking from department to department, mm -hmm. um, figuring out all the interesting things that, that happen in a, in a library. One of them is the history of its directors, which is possible since it's only existed for 130 years or whatever it is. And one of the directors that stood out to me was Charles Lummis. The thing that I think is really particularly fascinating about Lummis um, that makes him so important to this story is that really his role in the history of Los Angeles and partly in the history of America is as an advocate for an American identity that represented this part of America. Right. That it was like more than... Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, mm -hmm. but it included the Navajo, and it included the Miwok, and it included all the and the the Spanish. That seems like a big deal, and it seems like part of maybe why they thought it was a good idea for him to run the library, despite him having no <laughs> library experience, because the library, in part, maybe was an assertion of identity. I think that he. He is really important in that sense, that Los Angeles was no longer, certainly as he could influence it, not no longer trying to ape 
the culture of New York or Philadelphia or Chicago, but instead was having a sense of itself as a distinct place with its own identity. It's funny for us to imagine now, seeing Los Angeles as it is now, that the idea that you would build buildings that had a Spanish influence, that was just not done. You were trying at, at before this identity really kind of took hold. It was an effort to make L.A. look like the big cities of the Northeast. A sense of history of what had been here and who had been here was, that was new. I mean, his influence to say, well, this is what Los Angeles is. He was the founder of this, the Southwest Museum. That stuff wasn't being collected or preserved in any way. It was very radical, actually, what he did. And it's interesting because he didn't grow up here. He was definitely a transplant, but he really, truly fell in love with the essential old California character of this this amalgam of Spanish culture and Native American culture and, and the new culture of people moving in. And identifying it and really preserving it and celebrating it. Yeah, like most of the, the most of the important books of the early Los Angeles library, at least as you describe it, and I believe you, are about citrus fruits. <laughs> right. <laughs> and sheep herding. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, the, the initial, I mean, it gives you a real sense of the difference in what was going on in L.A. at the turn of the century versus... New York City, which had a well-established library that was already um, building a collection of important literary works, the among the initial purchases of the L.A. library when it was an association was formed to have a library happen were books about citrus, about beekeeping. I mean, this was a country town. If it was a couple thousand people, it was not a significant city. And then one of the other themes that continued, which was interesting, is that the library existed in rented space for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, people, It's uh, obviously, you can just imagine what the New York Public Library, the main branch of the New York Public Library looks like. That was the giant libraries of New York and Boston and all these cities yeah. that had been cities since the you know, 18th century. And in the meantime, Los Angeles at that point had a library that was on the upper floor of a department store. <laughs> and you would ride the elevator along with the people who were going shopping for brassiers. And, you know, they they would get off on the brassiere floor or the floor with children's clothing and you would ride on up and go to the library. And one of the, it, it was a, a cause for much embarrassment in the city, this feeling that, well, L.A. couldn't possibly be an intellectual center if it didn't have a library. Let's talk about the fire that destroyed a substantial portion of the central library and particularly a substantial portion of the collection. Um, it was driven by these stacks that basically functioned at like a like a charcoal chimney for your barbecue or grill and the the fire was absolutely catastrophic w what was the proportion of books that were destroyed and or damaged by this fire there were a million books either destroyed or damaged and that was about um, a little more than 50% of the entire collection 400,000 were, they were vaporized, basically. I mean, this was a fire that burned for seven and a half hours. It reached temperatures of 2,500 degrees. And as you say, it's the stacks, which were the, the area where the books that aren't out on the open shelves are stored in these stacks. And that's typical for a library. But the division between the different tiers within the stack, um, rather than being a ceiling which would keep a fire contained, they were open grating so that the fire basically just, these are seven tiers tall. 
and the fire simply just blasted through all seven tiers. It, it couldn't have been a better set up for a fire. I mean, this was a fire where these spaces had grown so hot that firefighters were having to leave after like five and ten minutes simply because they couldn't physically be there just because it got so hot inside the building. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing. They had these oxygen canisters that would normally last an hour and they were breathing so heavily because they were so hot that the canisters were lasting about 10 minutes. And they went through more than a thousand of these oxygen canisters and they had to keep swapping the teams out because nobody, it, it was just too hot to be in there, 2,500 degrees. doesn't matter if you're in a, a fire suit. It's just unbearable. At one point, over half of the entire city of Los Angeles fire department was working to try to put this fire out. And they ended up relying on the county to staff the firehouses around the city because nobody was around. They were all at the library trying to put the fire out and they needed somebody to be there in case someone else, someone's house caught on fire. I mean, it was a very, really difficult fire. And almost every firefighter I spoke to said they never fought a fire that was as challenging and as fierce as this fire. It was, I think for many of them, the, the, the sort of, I, I don't want to say the highlight of their career because obviously it wasn't something they were joyful about, but it was the most intense experience of their careers. The arson investigators event, eventually decided that arson had been the cause of the fire. Who was the person who was accused of having started it? A young man in his 20s named Harry Peake, who was, um, I guess, predictably uh, a wannabe actor, errand boy, um, you know, did odd jobs, parked cars, that kind of thing, um, was, well, what, what happened was he had told a number of friends that he had started the fire. So very quickly, uh, once there was a reward associated with anyone having providing a tip for solving the fire, uh, one of his friends, good to have friends like that, came forward and um, basically connected the fire department to him. And they began following him around, then ended up um, interviewing him to figure out whether his boasts of having started the fire were, were in fact, true. Because he was a charming liar. He was, I, from every description I had from anybody, he was an immensely likable guy, charming, and just a crazy fibber, and would just fib about stupid things, not just fib. You'd say, where, where have you been? And he'd say, oh, I was having drinks with Cher. You know, he just couldn't tell a straight story. And his friends would it, were exasperated by him and at the same time also said he was a really good guy. He would give you the shirt off his back. And that was interesting to me. They all used that exact expression. He would give you the shirt off his back. He was beloved and also drove them crazy. So in a way... This is what might be called a true crime narrative. I guess so. And I wonder if you felt pressured by the fact that you were telling a crime story to have a narrative that resolved comfortably, to provide an answer to the question. I, I did. I... First of all, I thought, I'm going to solve this, which is utterly vain. I mean, there, there's no way that a civilian with no access to the evidence and no knowledge of how to investigate an arson would be able to crack the case. But that was my first thought. I was, well, I'm going to solve this. 
Um, and maybe if you had a ragtag band of friends, it, right? And, and like you'd a say, special van. Yes, come on, guys, and a big dog, right? Yeah. Isn't that the the yeah. Scooby Doo premise? Mm-hmm. But um, I'm fairly comfortable with the idea that. I don't have to come to a final conclusion. And it may be out of the reality of so many of the things I write about don't have a tidy conclusion or don't resolve in the way that I might have expected them to resolve. In this case, I think following the different possible outcomes, it's a bit of a choose your own adventure. And and you come to your own conclusion, essentially, uh, because... There's no way to re-examine the evidence at this point. What I've tried to do is lay out all of those different paths of thought that could lead you to a conclusion. It may be that when I wrote The Orchid Thief and I was determined to see a ghost orchid and as time was growing short and I thought, oh my God, the book is ruined, I'm never going to see a ghost orchid, and I finally had a deadline that I had to make, and I didn't see one. Suddenly, it seemed like, well, of course I'm not going to see one. That's that's the point. It's It doesn't matter that I'm not going to see it. it. It would never match the anticipation of seeing it. So it was the first experience I had of a non-conclusion conclusion. And in its own way, it felt... I mean, it is the reality. It, it The fact is, without giving anything away, it's, it's not possible to come to a conclusion. I mean, my, my notion that I would solve it being something that very quickly I realize, well, that's nuts. But it isn't possible to ultimately know what happened. And... I was comfortable finally thinking, that's okay. I'm giving you the different paths of thought. And and um, maybe you see the one of them being the persuasive one. Well, Susan Orlean, I really loved your book, and I always love having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming over and taking the time. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Susan Orlean, her book, The Library Book, hits bookstores this week. I loved it so much. It's one of those books where Susan has such a keen eye for character detail and the details of story that when I was reading it next to my wife, I would pick out just a little thing that Susan wrote on every page and force my wife to listen to me reading it. She, uh, that is, Susan came to Max FunCon a couple of years ago, this event that we put on once a year, and she gave a talk uh, called Finding the Extraordinary in the Ordinary. And it was about how she feels like she can go to almost any place and find something special, a story that's worth writing in that place. And she's such a remarkable person that I believe she can do it. Uh, you can watch that talk totally for free uh, on the Maximum Fun YouTube channel or just by searching for Susan Orlean, Max FunCon. And, of course, we'll post a link to that on the Bullseye page at MaximumFun.org. 